this time the children are dismissed for kids in worship. Last week I began to share with you on a series entitled The Truth About Jesus. And we live in a world where there are those that are seeking the truth. And we as followers of Jesus Christ have that truth when it comes to Jesus. And there are many that are seeking, many that are looking. And the scriptures tell us that those that seek with their whole heart, they will find. And oftentimes that happens through the contact they have between you and I. And so as we go through this series, I want us to look at the truth about Jesus. Who is he? Why did he come? Because often there are those that have no clue when it comes to Jesus. This morning, if you have your, your Bibles, turn with me to Luke in chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, uh, you can grab one of the Pew Bibles, uh, the thin Pew Bible. It's on page 1019. If you have one of the thicker ones, it's on page 1077. But I want to share with you a passage that Luke uh, shares with us concerning uh, Jesus as he is talking with the religious leaders. And Jesus has uh, called his disciples. He has encountered a man with leprosy. And now on this particular occasion, uh, he is teaching and he has caught the attention of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And so Luke records for us what happens with this encounter. And it's in Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 17, Luke tells us one day as he was teaching, referring to Jesus, Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem were sitting there. And the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralytic on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. And when they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friends, he says, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk. But you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up. Take your mat and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been laying on, and went home, praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. How many of you here like action adventure movies? You like action adventure? A lot of people like action and adventure movies. Uh, I know growing up, I enjoyed you know, movies like Star Wars, uh, Indiana Jones. Uh, some of you probably enjoy Spider-Man, maybe some of the Clint Eastwood movies. But we get into those because there's so much action going on and there's suspense, wondering what's going to happen next. I mean, even as you watch television, even now, when you scroll through the channels, you, know, you all of a sudden you catch on a, an action adventure movie that's on. Don't you stop and you just kind of mesmerize what's going to happen? We all seem to just, you know, take that in and it, it catches our attention. And we can't look away. The story that Luke shares for us today, the healing of the paralytic. And the paralytic, the word paralytic, by the way, it's a rather large word, but it means the man was simply just paralyzed. He couldn't walk. But this story could be categorized as one of those action-adventure stories. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they
they all record this story. Each one of them includes it in their gospel. Now, Matthew, he doesn't go into as much detail as what Mark and Luke uh, give us. But it's included in each one of those Gospels. And I first, I first remember hearing this story as a child. I remember hearing this story when I was in Sunday school. And it was told through flannel graph figures. Now I know I'm dating myself, and I know some of the youth are sitting there and they're saying to me, what is flannel graph? Well, Google it, okay? Not now, but Google it. <laughs> And you'll find out. But they, they would use the flannel graph figures to tell this story. And I can remember uh, as a child, Mrs. Holmes, as she told this story, and it was exciting because she would put each one of the figures up on the flannel graph. And I can remember her making the story come alive. And she told us how these four men uh, were concerned for their friend that couldn't walk. And so they carried him on his mat. And they carried him the whole way uh, to, to this house where Jesus was. And they knew that Jesus was going to be able to help their friend. And when they get there, uh, they realize that, okay, we can't get into this house. The crowds have closed in around it. In fact, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law had the best seats. They were inside the house, and Jesus was conversing with them. He was teaching them. They were asking questions. And everyone is just closed in around the house trying to see what was going on. And as Jesus is teaching, they're straining to hear. And these four men come, come along with their friend and they realize they can't get through this crowd. They can't get into the door of this house. And then as the story continued to go, and as the flannel graph figures continued to be put up on the board, all of a sudden we see the scene of where the roof of the house is torn off. And here is their friend that they put him down through the roof, right in front of Jesus. And can you imagine uh, that sight? Can you imagine seeing that? Uh, looking up because, you know, the dirt's falling on your head as you're sitting in there listening to Jesus. And the dirt begins to, to, in, begins to come, come down and the roof is shaking because there's people on the roof. And all of a sudden, daybreak uh, breaks through the roof. Their sunlight comes through. And then you look up and you see these faces all looking down at you. And then all of a sudden, this man comes down and it stops right in front of Jesus. As a child, it was an exciting story. And as a child, it had all the elements of an action-adventure story. But most of us miss the point of this story. In fact, this story isn't about the paralyzed man. We always focus on the paralyzed man that's laying on the mat. But it isn't about him. And sometimes we look at it and, and we think, okay, well, it's about his faithful friends. But it isn't about his friends. This story isn't about them and the fact that they're trying to help their friend is paralyzed. The story isn't even about the miracle that happens of how you know, Jesus raises this man back to his feet. But we get caught up in all of that. But that's not what this story is about. This story is about what Jesus says. It's about what he says. Because what Jesus says tells us a great deal about who Jesus is. It tells us who Jesus is. If you look at verse 20, Jesus looks up and he sees these men looking down. And they lower this man down before him. And Jesus says to them, he sees their faith. And what does he say? Friend, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. This story is about who Jesus is and what he came to do. Who Jesus is and what he came to do. Jesus came to take care of the most important problem that we have. And the 
problem is sin. And the reason Jesus is able to take care of our sin problem is because of who he is. He is God. And that's what Jesus reveals to us in this story. He reveals to us who he is. He is God. Why do you think the reaction of the religious leaders was so, was, they, were, they were just in uproar over what Jesus has just said? They can't believe their ears. What has this man just said? And they become upset. They don't, they, they don't understand, you know, how can this man be forgiving sin? I mean, look at their response in verse 21. They're just outraged at what Jesus has just said. And they're, they're asking, who can forgive sins but who? But God alone. What Jesus is saying here, the words that he's using, what he is telling us here is that he is God. And he can forgive sin. Now what Jesus does here in the story, he's making his claim that he is God. God in the flesh. And the people that are looking around, they're amazed at what's just happened. But it's only the Pharisees and the Sadducees, I think, that really catch the implication of what Jesus has just said. And often people today miss who Jesus is because they don't hear what Jesus was saying about himself. And often people look at Jesus and they simply say, well, Jesus was just a good man. He was just a good man, a good example to follow. And yes, he was a good man, but it goes way beyond that. Because Jesus just didn't see himself as a good man. Jesus knows who he is and why he is here. That's what the story shows us about the paralyzed man. Because only God can take care of sin. Only God can forgive sin. You know, all the diseases and the bad things that are going on in our world, they are the result of sin. And yes, Jesus came and he healed. There were those that were blind that could see, those that couldn't walk that got up and walked. But that's not the reason Jesus came. He came because of the sin. The problem of sin. Because when sin entered God's perfect creation, it began to spiral down. And it gets worse, and it gets worse. The biggest problem is sin. And that's what Jesus is focusing on here. That's what he came to take care of. That's his whole reason for being here. And when God in the person of Jesus comes into the world, he comes in for that purpose. To remove the curse of sin. Because sin not only causes disease, but it causes death. Eternal death, spiritual death. The healings Jesus did, they revealed who, who he is. But those healings didn't fix the problem. Only Jesus could take care of the sin problem. That was Jesus' most pressing work. And that's what he was most concerned about. And that's why he says, your sins are forgiven. Because the healing, the diseases, those kind of things, that's just a symptom of the problem. And when Jesus says to, to the, the Pharisees, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? What Jesus is doing here is he is showing us what he's most concerned about. And he's concerned about the bigger problem. He's concerned about sin. What good does it do to heal someone? And then they lose their soul or eternity. Think it through. 
I mean, oftentimes we will share prayer concerns of people that, that have physical problems that we want to, to pray about. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. The, the scriptures tell us to bring those before the Lord that have physical problems that are sick. There's nothing wrong with praying for them. But did you ever think about their spiritual needs? See, that's what Jesus focuses on here. The spiritual need. Oftentimes, we're more concerned with the physical rather than the spiritual. We're more concerned about the body than we are the soul. See, Jesus was concerned about the soul. He was concerned about the problem of sin. And so God becomes flesh and dwells among us. The person of Jesus Christ, that's why he comes down. So that he can take care of sin. You know, Jesus claimed to be God, but there was another occasion in which he made that very same claim as to who he is and why he came here. If you have your Bibles and you want to jump over to John chapter 8, this is the only, the Gospel writer John is the only one that records this story. It's a story of how Jesus is in the, te in the temple and he's debating the religious leaders. This is, this is sometime later than this first story of the paralyzed man. But Jesus is now in Jerusalem. He's now been debating back and forth between the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, and they're looking to pick him apart. And they're trying to find a way. Trying to find a way. To make him make a mistake and show that he isn't who he claims to be. So they start their discussion concerning the fact that they are God's true children. And that's a hot topic. Because as Jesus looks around at them, he realizes that if you were truly God's children, you would understand who I am and why I'm. So a debate begins between Jesus and the religious leaders as to who God's true children are. And ultimately, the Jews bring in the fact that Abraham is their father. They go all the way back to the Old Testament and say, yes, Abraham, the one that God chose, you know, we are Abraham's children, therefore that makes us God's true children. And so they, they give their argument to Jesus. And what ends up happening at the end of this debate is Jesus shares these words with them that just throw them into a complete uproar. Jesus makes a statement that declares exactly who he is. And in John chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now notice, Jesus doesn't say, before Abraham was, I was. What Jesus is conveying here is that he is God. Jesus wasn't just saying that he was in, ex in existence before Abraham, which he is. He was there in the beginning, part of bringing into being all that is created. Jesus wasn't just saying that he was greater than Abraham, which he was, by the way. And the Jews understood that. Jesus was making his divinity clear in this statement because what Jesus is doing here is he is making himself equal with the great I am of the Old Testament. And he wanted them to understand who he is, that he is God. And those Jews, those Pharisees, those religious leaders would have known exactly where this is coming from, because it would have taken them all the way back into Exodus, the book of Exodus, where they learn of how Moses, when God calls Moses to go and rescue his people, the Jews, out of, out of Egypt. And some of you have probably seen the movie, you know, the Ten Commandments. It comes around every year, because it's always the week that... Uh, the Jews celebrate Passover, and that movie is almost always on television. And some of us have probably seen it year after year. Charlton Heston, you know, is Moses. That's a stretch. But we see that movie every year, and we see how, you know, God sends Moses 
uh, you know, to rescue his people. And what does God, what does Moses do? He has an argument with God. No, you got the wrong guy here. You, not me. And so he has an argument with God. No, I'm, you're, I'm the wrong one. And then ultimately what happens is, you know, Moses finally says, okay, I'll go. But, okay, suppose I get there and they ask me, who, who is it that is, that is sending you to us? What's the name uh, of our God that is sending you? That is sending you to us. Who am I supposed to say you know, has sent me? And in Exodus 3, verse 14, God says to Moses these words. He says, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. They knew exactly what Jesus was doing. He was making himself equal with God because he is God in the flesh. He is the second person of the Trinity, Jesus. And he comes to them and he reveals to them who he is. Now as I close this today, I want, I want you to understand, we can't simply look at Jesus and simply say that Jesus was a good man, but I don't believe that he was God. Because Jesus claims to be God. You can't say, I believe Jesus is a good man, but I don't believe he's God. Because Jesus claimed to be God, and if he claimed to be God, and he really wasn't, then he's a liar, and he's not a good man that you want to follow. You can't say, I believe Jesus is a good man, but I don't believe he is God. Because if Jesus claimed to be God, and he really isn't, then he was just crazy, insane, and he's not somebody you want to follow. When Jesus stepped into this world, he stepped into it with a divine nature and a divine purpose. And it's mapped out clearly who Jesus is and why he came here. He was the long-awaited Messiah. Last week, as we looked at who is Jesus, we saw from the scriptures that he is the Messiah. He is the long-awaited one. And we established the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, and we established that through the prophecies of Isaiah. But Jesus, not only is he the Messiah, the long-awaited one, but that Messiah is God in the flesh. That came to take care of sin. That's why John, the Apostle John, when he wrote his gospel, he began those verses in chapter 1, and he began with this, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Jesus is God in the flesh, not just a good man. And he came with a purpose. And that purpose was to take care of sin and to offer forgiveness, to offer eternal life to those that receive him. The, the testimony that you heard of David Nasser at the beginning of the service, he grew up in a country where uh, he was a Muslim. He grew up in that faith. And when he finally, he and his family finally came to America, finally got here, he didn't want to have anything to do with religion. And it wasn't religion that saved him. It was Jesus. Because he finally came to believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be. He finally believed that yes, he came to take care of my sin. Maybe that's where you are today. Maybe, it's, maybe somebody's sitting here today and thinking, well, I always just thought Jesus was just a good man, somebody to follow, a good example. And Jesus came as God in the flesh with a purpose to take care of our sin. And today, if you want to know that Jesus, I'd be happy to sit down and share with you that Jesus came to take care of your sin. Father, this morning we thank you for Jesus. 
He is God in the flesh. And Father, we realize that Jesus didn't just come to heal people of their physical problems. Father, Jesus came to take care of the biggest problem of all, our spiritual problem, sin. This separates us from you. And Father, I pray today for that one that maybe, maybe they've never heard how Jesus came to take care of their sin. And, and Father, I pray for that one that just looks at Jesus as, that, as, as a good person and a good example of follow. Father, I pray today that they might come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, the one that came to heal them and take care of their sin. Father, we live in a world today where everybody looks at the physical. But Father, our biggest problem is spiritual. Father, today, I pray for that one that needs to know Jesus Christ, that we might have opportunity to share Jesus Christ with them. Not religion, but Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray.